Welcome to the Lubber's Hole, a Patrick O'Brien podcast. You're with Ian and Mike. And together we are rereading the Aubrey Maturin series of novels by our favourite novelist, Patrick O'Brien. We are partway through The Surgeon's Mate. So, Mike, can you help us get oriented? Where are we up to? What things might we expect to hear about in this next chapter or so? Well, Ian, as we know, over the last couple of episodes, Jack, Diana, and Stephen are back home in England. Everybody's celebrating this victory. Jack has gotten to see his children again, and some for the first time, and reunited with Sophie. Matron has gone to see Sir Joseph Blaine and been brought up to speed on some important activities at the Admiralty, some not so, uh, not so good for Jack as well as some of their latest mission in the Baltic, which Stephen has given his seal of approval to, involving Catalan independence. And we've gotten Stephen pursuing his invitation to speak in Paris and the possibility of taking Diana along with him to Paris here. So we also heard a little ominous warning from Sir Joseph saying to uh, Stephen, be careful of the French. <laughs> they might smoke you as an intelligence agent. And we've been brought up to date with how dire Jack's situation with Kimber is. Luckily, through Stephen, he's found a lawyer. He's found a lawyer that perhaps can help him here. So as we move into chapter five, we're going to follow Stephen to Paris. And we're also going to find out that uh, there are some other things that are a little bit discomforting for Jack in the offing here. Also, this week, we're going to be spending time with internet historian and 1812 war expert Adam Franti, who's going to help us think about where that war came from and how it's all going to wrap up as our heroes go back over the Atlantic and back into the world of Napoleon. Polish up your sabres and join us. And you know, Mike, at the end of our discussion of the last chapter, we talked about how we hadn't yet quite found the inciting event. We hadn't really yet found the moment that really kicks the story into high gear. And we're almost halfway through the book. We're about 40% of the way through the book, I think. That was just making me think here, what's going on with O'Brien? There's nothing that says he has to obey the rules of traditional dramatic structure. But I think most authors of fiction that's aimed at an audience of this kind would probably have pulled out the, the complication, the inciting event a lot earlier. And I'm wondering that this is either, first of all, a, a really confident author who's at the height of his powers, who knows his audience and is willing to trust them to go along with him. Maybe he's an author who's being a little bit lazy and taking his audience for granted and putting some episodic rambling back and forth in before he really gets going. Maybe it's an author who's deliberately stretching the rules, the classical rules of dramatic structure, despite all the other homage that he pays to authors like Homer. Or maybe he's also an author that's thinking, well, I have this long narrative arc in mind and I have to carve it up into bits that look like a whole book and that therefore the publishable whole book chunks aren't as close to dramatic structure of their own as they might be. I think, on the whole, I prefer answer one. I think this is really a sign that O'Brien is confident and knows just how to write a compelling story about compelling characters without doing the thriller writer tricks that we're talking about here. But it does make me look forward to the moment <laughs> when we get into chase mode and we get into high gear. Maybe I'm missing all the adrenaline from the uh, the Jason Bourne spy scenes that we had on the streets of Boston in Fortune of War. Well, it's interesting because Tom Clancy pulls this off but he does it with the run. You know, he can go 175 pages with three what appear to be completely separate story arcs and then bring them excitingly together. But I think it's a testament to O'Brien that I don't know many series that people read over and over and over again, these circumnavigation. I think, as you say, this confident author at the height of his powers who's a learned cove and a very deep file, as he might say of others, that can pull this off. And that, in fact, sometimes the inciting events have all been subtly woven through this intricate tapestry. And lo and behold, we find them sometimes from three books earlier. And so I think some people have said this is perhaps one of the longest, if not the longest book ever written. It just happens to be chopped into 21 different volumes. Meanwhile, it doesn't seem like anything is urgently about to happen because Stephen sets off 
to pay a visit to Ireland to review some property, which is the thing that he always does when he does any consequential travel to get him off the scene for a while. And meanwhile, Diane has been staying with Mrs. Fortescue, whose husband, Captain Fortescue, is known to them, who has five children. And Diana, we're pretty sure, doesn't have a strong maternal instinct. And of course, she shows us that. She calls them the loathsome brood. Stephen could see with Diana that she's covering some deep unhappiness, some recent distress or vexation, you know, Brian tells us about. And the reason appears quickly on the scene when these five kids and their mother show up. And O'Brien writes that Mrs. Captain Fortescue is one of those naval wives who has so often caused him, caused Stephen, to reflect upon the sailor's condition. He describes through Stephen's eyes are as, as big, plain, coarse-complexioned, rather masculine, breezy, confident, and clearly hostile toward and scared of Diana. I'm paraphrasing all there, but boy, talk about setting a scene here. And this is just setting up the contrast between <laughs> the humdrum, rather ordinary and everyday world of marriage and the ideal, you might say, of Diana that Stephen has in his head. And there's another one of these nice juxtapositions coming here. I'm perhaps skipping a few pages ahead. But when Fortescue comes home, he notices that Stephen is, is admiring lilies in the, in Fortescue's garden. And he realizes that several of these red beetles were copulating in his sight, increasing and multiplying. And he decries the terrible, vile, French, morally degenerate behavior of the beetles. And I was taken right back to the juxtaposition between Jack and Molly Hart in Mahon and Stephen's observation of a female praying mantis <laughs> eating the head off her mate. So I think O'Brien's sending us a message here about how he views human relationships and how he views the mating habits of insects as a bit of a metaphor and a bit of a symbol for us to look at. Yeah, I, I think so much so. I mean, even in this scene with Stephen arriving and Diana and Mrs. Fortescue, Stephen kind of tunes out this argument, but... Uh, it's, it's clear that there's a great deal of hostility. And so here's this, what could be domestic bliss, but is not. But then the wife turns on Stephen, I think having lost this argument with Diana and thinks, well, you know, she's paid Stephen no mind because she's married to a captain and Stephen is a mere naval surgeon, which has no rank whatsoever. And she says, tell me, sir, with a look of commiseration, is it true that in the Prussian service, surgeons are required to shave the officers? And in the midst of this domestic not bliss, in the midst of of all this confrontation with Diana and Mrs. Fortier, Stephen says, Ah, and in our own, it is worse by far. Dear Lord, how often have I not been set to black Captain Aubrey's shoes? So he refuses to take the bait. <laughs> and luckily, Mrs. Fortescue's husband, Captain, walks in, <coughs> and his wife is like a whole different person. The anger's gone. But the kids who have been in the background, you know, kind of messing around with this flower stand with each other, crash the thing over, given Stephen and Diana the chance to escape in the garden and to escape this ensuing chaos here. So again, as you say, Stephen, Diana, thinking about marriage, Diana being pregnant. Is this the life in front of you? Is this Jack, Sophie? What? Yeah, what's going on here with all this, right? And there's another one of those really nice, it's almost non sequitur moments as the paragraph closes with Captain Fortescue denouncing the Beatles again, saying they're dogs, the vile French vermin. The opening of the next paragraph is Paris was in all its charming splendor, the trees full leaf under a gentle smiling sky, the Seine almost blue, the streets filled with moving color. <laughs> So they're either vile French vermin or they live in a beautiful street with moving color. So I think we know which way O'Brien swings on this. He's a fan of Paris and he's a fan of the French. <laughs> Stephen and Diana, you know, they, they're walking through the garden together. Stephen gives her the news that uh, he's got her release obtained from Sir Joseph. So they're free to live in London. They're kind of confined to London or the home counties but at least you'll be out of this confinement. She's happy to do that, but she tells Stephen that she really can't live in London or even in England because she's really afraid of running into family and acquaintances, as she says, with great belly and no husband. 
She remembers the gossip of India with Canning, the gossip around Halifax with her and Johnson, and she does not want to do this. And Stephen is kind of telling her, hey, look, you know, when we're married, you don't have to worry about any of this, right? We'll be all together. You've got the cover. And she replies, and, and here we go, big change. I'll be damned to hell before I marry a man when I am with child by another. You would not rid me of it when I asked you, and I promised to do nothing myself. I respected your wishes. Respect mine, dear Stephen. Dear Stephen, pray, take me to Paris. And she recounts how she knows many people there. She had lived there when she was growing up. She lived there caring for her cousin. You remember the teapot? (laughs) And she remarks that in Paris, no one knows or cares exactly what is past. So she tells Stephen she can live there happily. She's a widow. They won't care that she's pregnant. And Stephen agrees to take her along, which is where we get to, as you say, this beautiful Paris. And we get something that they haven't done together before. I'm just noticing it as I sit here looking through the notes. Stephen and Diana haven't shared any of their personal backstory with each other that we know of. Certainly it hasn't been recounted in the O'Brien text. And O'Brien, apart from the sketchy outlines of their resumes, hasn't really said anything about episodes in their past and certainly not the fact that they both lived in Paris for a while. Diana is a young girl and Stephen is a medical student. And they were strolling arm in arm through Paris, pointing out landmarks and you know scenes from their lives as younger people. And it's a really touching moment. This is something that we've been denied so far as any insight into much of the, the personal side of Stephen's life before we first met him in Master and Commander. And it's very nice. And we feel this gush of sympathy, I think, for the two of them and a little bit of a rom-com moment. What's not to like about walking arm in arm along the banks of the Seine? Yeah, and how well they can do that. Stephen wanting to be very normal, wanting to keep his cover. Diana just delighted to be there. And as you say, it looks like you could just zoom the camera in, see their smiling faces and think, this is Paris. It's the city of lights. Everything is beautiful here. And it's an environment that feels like it's going to look after Diana as well. Partly because, as she said before, she doesn't have to care so much about what family and acquaintances think of her and her reputation. So she can be more at ease with who she is in her situation. And it also turns out that there are people here who can help her and help them as a couple. So Stephen tells Diana about this fantastic character. I don't think we hear very much first person speech from Ademar de la Motte who's a wealthy friend of Stevens, but we get loads of character detail and it's super appealing. I'd really like to see Ademar de la Motte on a chat show. <laughs> Stephen describes de la Motte as a civilized creature. He lives for music and painting and he is fond of women as friends, handsome women that know how to dress. I believe you will like him. His acquaintance will certainly make your life more entertaining. He knows everyone with any sort of taste or style in Paris and he is still quite rich. He has no political position of any kind, no political activity. Men of his tastes, which pretty clearly means men who date men, men of his tastes form, as it were, an occult society, almost Freemasonry. And it's funny, isn't it? I'm sure that's been the case for gay men in cities in centuries past, but it's not even spoken of in British society, even though I'm sure it was there. And it is absolutely spoken of in French society. And Stephen admires that in French society. And he's pleased that that allows a character like de la Motte to be there, to be part of the network and to look after Diana. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, and you know, he, he even goes on to tell Diana that this being kind of part of that society is what saved him when the rest of his family went to the scaffold. And it's also one of the reasons why he has such an empty house So he's delighted to have Diana's company. He'll be protected. And it sounds like he knows people that could be very helpful to Diana. Now, Stephen warns Diana that it would never do to show the least awareness of Lamont and his sexual preferences. He says that he believes he's quite undetected. He's very much afraid of scandal. And to beguile the world, he professes a passion for the chaste Madame Duroc, the banker's wife. And on the one hand, I'm thinking, oh my gosh, this is such a beautiful setup for Diana. Although it really kind of crushes my heart to think that here is somebody who's obviously a fascinating human being, a wonderful man, and who's got these great connections, has done wonderful things, and has to live this cloaked 
life like this, but what a gift this is to Diana and Stephen. So they learn some more, I think, about each other as well. They learn a little bit about Diana and her father and Stephen's cousin Fitzgerald, who lived in the same hotel at about the same time. Stephen's arranged it so that Diana can spend time in the city being entertained at the Hotel de la Motte, as de la Motte's house is known, and to spend the rest of the time in the countryside with Colonel Fitzgerald. And knowing that Diana's time will come just as soon as it comes for any woman, he's arranged the best accoucheur, the best man midwife in Europe, Baudelot, to wait on her during pregnancy. O'Brien uses this moment to highlight a couple of coincidences. And Mike, we've talked about these in the conversation that we had with Eva Sandor. But it is just worth pointing out to readers, I think, that there is this, in air quotes, coincidental moment of the coach going by carrying Talleyrand, this famous French statesman, and that we're going to need to know about that and need to know about the name and the role of Talleyrand later on in the story. Right. All of this set up by this coincidence of finding out that both Stephen's cousin and Diana as a child were at this hotel in Paris at about the same time. O'Brien just has that beautiful piece about coincidences that to me almost read a little bit like the butterfly effect, although as coincidence, not causality. But it's funny, in one of those coincidences that Stephen kind of lists off for Diana, he says, just as this happens, Jack might be out fox hunting, but checks himself and says, yeah, it's not the season for fox hunting. And indeed, and O'Brien, I love it, just, you know, without skipping a beat, says Jack was not fox hunting. <laughs> Jack was actually returning from visiting his father. Huh, I think he would have enjoyed fox hunting at least somewhat. I don't think he's enjoyed the visit to his father, though. So now it's time for us to take a short break. We're going to be right back in a few moments. So there's something that we want to tell you all about the way that we're planning to develop the podcast going forward and give you new ways to get involved in the life of the podcast and help us out as well. We just announced on social media, several of you have seen it already and, and come to our aid. We appreciate that, that we are now accepting patrons for The Lover's Hole. It's always going to be free to download. But if you would like to help defray some of the expenses of producing The Lover's Hole, we're now giving you an opportunity to do that easily and directly. And in return for your help, we'd love to offer you the chance to stay closely involved with the podcast, to get access to some patrons-only specials that we'll be creating, get the inside scoop on some of our materials and where the show is going next. We'd love it if you can get on board. You can find us and find out about the opportunities to help us out at patreon.com forward slash lubber's hole. You'll know you'll have found the right place because you'll see our logo and our graphics right there. There are loads of content creators on the internet who manage to engage with their audiences via Patreon. We're really happy that it seems to suit us and you, our listeners, really well. So we hope that you'll enjoy participating with us in this way. And that's Patreon, P A T. R E O N dot com forward slash lovers all. A glass of wine with all of you. Welcome back. You're with Ian and Mike listening to The Lovers Hole. So we get a couple of bits of background here on Jack's father. We get more detail, first of all, about just what a pain in the posterior. General Aubrey is being not only with his new radical political career, but also with the decorations that he's making to the house and the company that he's keeping and these fast living, hard drinking, high playing men that he's hanging out with, city men, money men, politicians, but Jack says unlike politicians. And he notices, as as a Patrick O'Brien character would, that these people are harsh and unfeeling to their horses, brutal to their dogs, and rude to their servants. So this is a pretty unhappy situation for Jack, seeing the world that his father's got himself into. It is. And it's interesting because Jack, you know, as much as his father has sort of gotten in his way and said some outlandish things to Sophie, <laughs> Jack still, you know, goes home. He reveres home. He's hurt that his room is now gone from his home. And I love how O'Brien paints the scene that as Jack is riding off away from his home, he gets to this hill in which every time he's ever left, he stops to look back on it. And this time he does not. He just continues to ride straight ahead. 
And Mike, I think there's a bit of a theme here, if I can be indulged in a theme for a minute. Older male characters who we come across in passing who are not at their best in various ways. In the opera Marriage of Figaro, we've got Count Almaviva, the patriarch and the adulterer who gets outwitted by younger, sexier protagonists. We've got General Aubrey trying to rekindle a bit of youth by marrying a dairymaid and meanwhile destroying his old family home and being a political liability to his son. We had Herapath Senior in the previous book, who it turned out was all promises and no bottom when it came to holding the horses and looking after the carriage. And if we look just a very short while ahead, we've got the figure of Pompeo Ponsic, the elder statement of Catalan society who's been depended on for this job to take care of the Catalan brigade that's garrisoning the island of Grimm's home. But as we're going to hear, venerable old Ponsic is not only venerable, but vulnerable as well. So for these old guys, these older guys, I mean, it, it would only be worse if they also played the German flute. But I think we're seeing this from Jack's point of view. There is this cruel impact of age. Jack even referred to the youthful feeling that he got being around Miss Smith back in Halifax, saying that he thought this might be the exception that proves the rule and that Jack himself feels that actually he has aged and is aging. And this is a pretty gloomy prognosis, I think, for Jack. Well, yeah, absolutely. And it happens right here. I think your your observation is is spot on in that um, as he's riding straight ahead and not looking back at home, he sees this little schoolhouse where he went as a child and where he had his first love. She was the niece of his school teacher and later became the teacher herself. And O'Brien recounts these little details about how Jack used to follow her around like a little puppy. And now he sees her there with her children, sort of sending them off. And she's, as O'Brien writes, a simpering spinster, silly, withered on the branch. And Jack kind of, you know, it says he rides on with a grieved heart. And then O'Brien writes about Jack. He was not an introspective man by any means. And his life had not left him much time for a great deal of self-examination. But long, sad thoughts about age, death, and decay, change, decrepitude, deterioration pursued him even into the chase and followed him along the high road. So he's gotten off his horse, he's gotten into a chase, and he's thinking back, as you say, Ian, and I think all of this is coming together. And as you said, Jack thinks to himself, it must be so because I felt positively young with that girl in Halifax. And it is the exception that proves the rule. And he thinks back about these hot times that they had there, but he can't even recall her name. And he thinks that this is conduct that he would find odious in another man, but he actually starts to sort of smirk as he falls off to sleep in the coach here, thinking about it for himself. So we've got a few strands here that are kind of weaving around about Jack's character, about age, about things kind of going bad a little bit here. And we're introduced to the idea that the next step in his career might not be the unvarnished glory that he'd hoped for. We know that he's been offered the uh, post of captain of a stationary receiving ship in Plymouth, which is not a seagoing command. It's a receiving ship where they take freshly pressed hands to be processed and then distributed onto the fleet. Doesn't sound like a plum job for a dashing frigate captain. Jack thinks that they could at least have made him a Royal Marine Colonel with high pay. And Sophie says, well, doesn't, doesn't that mean corruption, Jack? That sounds like, a, you know, a backhander. You were always very much against corruption, she says, when you were young. I mean, younger. <laughs> and Jack says, and so I am. Corruption in others is anathema to me, but you would scarcely credit the depths of turpitude I should descend to myself for a thousand a year, and a colonel's pay is rather better than that. And he goes off and does his mental math and figures out exactly what the pay for a Royal Marine colonel would be. So we get this willingness, I think, of Jack to deceive himself. He deplores corruption in others, but when he's in the dockyard, he's pretty flash at flashing the cash. And if it helps him to get his boat outfitted and to get out to sea to meet the enemy, then he's actually pretty okay with it. And something then seems to be looking up, Mike, because we have a letter from the lawyer. Everybody knows that letters from lawyers are good, right? Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, second only to letters from what I would say the IRS. Yeah, the yeah. tax man. <laughs> yeah. 
a tax man. The only one who's actually what in the UK, Ian, able to uh, to go after you <laughs> with violence, right? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. There are, so, there are still some ancient revenue laws that permit the tax man to, I think, pursue you with muskets and hang you at midnight from the yard arm or something. Anyhow, the the, the lawyer, Mister Skinner, is really, as Jack says, taking the war into the enemy's camp. He's written, or rather, he has sued a writ of duches tecum. And Mike, I think we discovered that that is a short form of the long phrase subpoena duches tecum, which means under pain of punishment, you shall bring stuff with you, which in modern law, I think we would just call a subpoena. But Latin and law and Jack are not a combination made in heaven. So Sophie asks what this means. And Jack says, well, my Latin is not very good, but Dux is a leader and an admiral, as you might say, and the plural is duches. So you could construe duches tecum as admirals are with thee <laughs> and you can't say better than that <laughs> who wouldn't want an admiral so he's got this letter from the admiral which he's happy to see then the next letter he opens is from grant his former lieutenant on the leopard who had left the ship rather than to stay with jack and try to save it and who to put salt more in the open wound uh, you know when grant after grant had left the ship and gotten back to the cape he had written to Sophie and to Jack's superior saying that Jack was obstinate and clearly would not survive because he didn't have the good sense to go with Grant. And Grant accuses Jack in this letter of spreading rumors about him leading to his unemployment, when in fact we know, and Jack tells again to Sophie, that he went out of his way to put in a good word for Grant when he had returned. And Grant in this letter threatens to oppose Jack with the Admiralty to smear his name in public. Um, and Jack, in kind of true Jack Aubrey style, says, well, he must have been kind of out of his mind or drunk when he wrote this. I'll just ignore it. <laughs> so, <weird. laughs> But it's a threat to Jack's character and to the moral certainty that I think that he has of knowing that he's vindicated in the world and he's okay. So hang on, let's just follow the pattern here. We've had good news letter from the lawyer saying we're subpoenaing the opposition. Disturbing news this character Grant is threatening to reveal unsavory truths as he sees them about Jack. Next, though, we're back into good news letters because we have a letter from Tom Pullings, who he says has drunk three times three to Jack and Sophie with three fellow officers. So we've got Mowat and Babington, both of whom we know, former midshipmen who followed Jack in the past, and one Henry James. And Mike, I don't think you and I could find Henry James anywhere, could we? No, no, no. I'd love to know from our listeners if anybody knows a Henry James in the canon, especially a Henry James who presumably is a former midshipman and officer under Jack somewhere in his command. Or whether maybe O'Brien is just dropping in a little name drop of the Anglo-American author Henry James, who might well have been the kind of author that O'Brien would admire. And he's thinking, well, I need a spare name, so I'll just drop in the name of a writer and see if they smoke it. <laughs> yeah. And you picked up this great pattern, Ian, of good news, bad news, good news, and then the next letter. And Jack looks down. He doesn't recognize the handwriting, the seal, flips it open with kind of not even realizing that he's done it and starts to read. And it's Miss Smith from Halifax, the young lady whose name he couldn't remember just a little while ago. But now he remembers it very well. She calls him her hero, tells him she's pregnant can't wait to come see him could he please ask one of his navy captain friends to bring her along she doesn't care if it's in a cartel or a man of war and oh by the way please send 500 pounds to cover her debts before she leaves halifax she dearly hopes mrs aubrey will be much more understanding than lady nelson was about lord nelson's <laughs> promises to be waiting for him and his letters this is the same ariadne who fled with her hero aboard ship in the stories of king minos of crete and the minotaur immortal wife of the wine god dionysus and according to some parts of the legend dionysus claimed ariadne as his wife therefore causing theseus to abandon her so i think o'brien is investing miss smith with deep knowledge of the classics but whether she knows it or not is going right over jack's head right yeah that ariadne had helped theseus escape from the minotaur and then sure enough after he takes her with her and beds her abandons her so it's kind of 
maybe you know putting the pins to jack here a little bit yeah and mike for me this is one of those inciting events this is the moment where you realize okay now everything has changed jack's got a real reason to be somewhere else or to be doing something else and the thing that he's circled the globe to come back to which is his family and his loving relationship with sophie and his career in the navy all of that is suddenly threatened by this and it was one of those heart-sinking moments i think in the canon absolutely and and we know what jack always wants to do in a situation like this you know it's his beam me up scotty moment where he says get me to see yeah. right <laughs> So, fortunately, almost as if he knew that that was the question on the reader's mind, Patrick O'Brien shifts the action to Paris and Stephen. Now, Stephen's actually having a bit of a time fending off well-wishers who want him to convey information to royalists and Bourbonists back home in England. And he's very aware that they might well be cover visits, they might be false flag approaches. He's being provoked into seeming to be acting against the French interests. But he's already said that's not his principle. That's not what he's there to do. And I think he's a bit irritated by all these approaches. He thinks they're all a bit clumsy and heavy handed. He's determined not to break his cover. Right. And and I love O'Brien saying about how these people are so clumsy about this, although some of their wives do a much better job at it. (laughs) However, he's still alert, I think, for news. He's not there to gather intelligence, but he is thinking that there's going to be news and political gossip, if you like. And that's one of the reasons why he's looking forward to his presentation at the Institute. And he hears in conversation that Sir Joseph was right, that Napoleon is still in a position to turn the tide of war. There's been this big recent battle in Moravia. I think that's the Battle of Kulm, but we'll find out about that later. And He has this nice tender moment where he goes to pick up Diana. She chides him for forgetting his wig and kisses him, it says, as fondly as a sister. And Stephen thinks, my sister? My spouse? Oh, Lord. Oh, Lord. (laughs) This would be bad enough coming from the woman you love. But not only is it the woman you love, but here is Diana absolutely stunning, exquisitely dressed in a new made dress. We talked to Karen about you know, these new made dresses, the height of Paris fashion and wearing her diamonds with the large blue Peter right there in the middle. Stephen notes how attached she is to the diamonds. You know, he, he makes this comment to Diana and Diana replies, yes, I am. M, I truly love them, she says, above all the blue Peter. She detached the pennant stone and put it in her hand where it lay strangely heavy, sending out countless prismatic flashes at the slightest movement. I don't give a damn where it comes from, she went on, raising her chin. I love them passionately. I should not part with them for anything on earth, and I shall certainly be buried in them. You will remember that, Stephen. If things do not go well this autumn, I am to be buried in them. I may rely on you. And Stephen says, certainly you may, which is kind of a, you know, again, I was like, whoa, 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 hold on. It's a little dark. And my God, you know, Diana, you love jewels. We get that. But boy, you are so attached to these things. And then O'Brien kind of puts a little icing on the cake because she goes on to speak to Stephen about some of her other jewels, the great pearls that she loved these great rubies and how she sold them and how Stephen's friend has helped her get great prices and everything and that she'll sell any of her jewels, but never the diamonds. So, wow, this attachment to the diamonds. Again, stick a pin. (laughs) Yeah, yeah, we might come back to that. Uh, Meanwhile, the meeting at the Institute where Stephen is going to present a paper on, among other things, I think, the bones of the solitaire of the island of Rodriguez. Stephen admits that he's nervous. And let's just remember for a second, this is Stephen, the cold-eyed duelist. This is Stephen, the dissembling intelligence agent. This is Stephen, the one who undid the French and American intelligence networks and took care 
of Bray and Ponte Cane in a Boston hotel room. He's nervous about speaking in public. I, I think there are lots of us who can feel that maybe irrational, but certainly real anxiety that he's got about making a presentation in public. And it's interesting, he puts on blue spectacles and he describes them as giving him countenance. And Mike, there's some, there's some interesting wordplay going on there, isn't there? Right, right. It's fascinating because, you know, we, we read in the Bible with, with God appearing to Moses about countenance, a person's face or facial expression. That's the first definition of the word. But the second, countenance means support. So these glasses that give him support, but so change his facial expression. O'Brien could have said the glasses give me confidence, but such simple words would never do here. No. And meanwhile, she's trying to bolster his confidence. She says how distinguished he is, how everyone said he has a most prodigious mind, and she calms him with a glass of brandy. Ah. Ah. So he gets to the Institute, and the news about this battle in Moravia is completely unreliable. There are some people who say that, uh, no, 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 it's all been fine. Napoleon was there. It's all under control. There are some people who are saying it's been a rout, and the general in charge is kind of discredited. So he's got all these different versions of what's happening in the political world, I think, tumbling around in his head. And he gives this loud and aggressive opening and then shocks himself, it says, shocks himself almost fatally and then mumbles his way all the way through his speech. It says, skipping a page once while reading so that all his observations on the dodo seemed to apply to the wombat. And at one point, <laughs> in a good bit of O'Brien toilet humor he introduces a comparison to the intromittent organ of the raven and a deaf woman in the front row asks what that is and her friends whisper to her she says oh like a stallion i had no idea so much the better and mike i don't know about you i found this whole story of the speech really difficult to read really discomforting on behalf of Stephen, it's not going well at all. It's not going well. Stephen's upset by this interruption, so he stands there rhythmically waving a mummified example of the intermittent organ, <laughs> kind of at this woman, going on a bit sterner here. It's it's almost hilarious. And and on the other hand, you know, I can kind of remember myself doing speeches early in the career, kind of going, "Oh, please, God, open the floor and let me drop through." But Stephen plows on. So. On first inspection, given this is the the peak of his scientific career, he's come to share these great learned insights with this international, maybe even global scientific audience. It's going terribly badly. I mean, he's just not landing points and the audience is laughing at him and I'm blushing on his behalf. I read this and my face goes scarlet. But then we discover a couple of upsides and the first of the upsides is that all these rumours circulate among the knowledgeable French people in the room that there is no way that this man can have anything to do with intelligence. They completely dismiss the rumour that Stephen is a spy. Nobody who can be so unpersuasive, apparently stumbling, apparently incompetent, apparently ill-prepared, nobody with this character could possibly do the deeds of the legend that they think they might associate with Stephen Maturin. Right. These ministers' assistants, we know the chief of police that was in the audience there. Um, Apparently, everybody who's come to sort of check this out say, this guy has anything to do with intelligence near or far. I am the Pope. (laughs) So, uh, And and they also, interestingly, they talk about Stephen's relationship with Diana, this woman he's come with. and, And they assure each other that, ah, he's Diana's physician. And he's likely a pederast. In a way, Stephen's got some protection. Diana has some protection. So this thing that looked like a big faux pas has really worked in Stephen's favor. And we get this other little thing that apparently people have come to hear these speakers time and time again. And everyone local assumes that for foreign guests, the standard of oratory was often in inverse proportion to the speaker's scientific worth. Love that. Only the French can do. Right? God bless him. So actually, for the knowledgeable insiders in the audience, he's doing fine. He's managed to dismiss to all the other people in the audience the notion that he might have anything to do with intelligence. O'Brien, along the way, has given Stephen this description of himself. He says, I am no Demosthenes. And that was a really great choice of a comparison character, wasn't it? Demosthenes was an orator and a statesman. 
He made political speeches about the need to resist the aggressive tendencies of Philip of Macedonia. <laughs> Which sounds a little bit like Stephen's work against Bonaparte. So Demosthenes, a pretty good choice. <laughs> right. Some historians even believe that even though he was a great orator, that he was a stutterer. So, I mean, again, O'Brien bringing all this together. It sounds just like Stephen, who's just sort of worked his way uh, not very well through this speech, certainly hates Bonaparte. And what a great comparison. But one that we could just read and think, yeah, yep, lovely. Or unpack that Easter egg just a little bit. So Mike, we, we said there were there were two payoffs. So the first payoff for Stephen's stumbling and apparently bad speech was that he's really wiped out any idea of himself as an intelligence agent. The second payoff is that as he's standing there awkwardly and people are sort of not making eye contact, he does make eye contact across the room with an eminent German philosopher who's an authority on romance languages, looking uncharacteristically sad. And in this moment, Stephen gets the news that Pompeo Ponsic has been killed. The ship he was travelling on met with disaster. The ship sank and Ponsic's body, along with many others, has been washed ashore and identified. Right. And... Again, you talk about the action shifting in that Stephen goes from sort of this whole intense about addressing the Institute and boom, moves into action. He pulls Diana aside. He realizes in his mind, this is Sir Joseph Blaine's mission. This is the Catalans on the island up in the Baltic. This has failed. He has got to get moving. Having taken Diana aside, he tells her that he's leaving the next day. And she's thinking that he's staying till the end of the month. She's really shocked. He says, I'll keep up with you through news, through his friends and through her doctor. So you're not going to hear from me, but he doesn't say why. He says, don't worry, I'll be keeping up with you. And he gives her the name and address of a friend of his that Diana is to contact if she has any trouble in Paris or Normandy where he set her up tells her to memorize it and then burn the paper. Very different. Very different, Steve, here. Yeah. And again, I think, Mike, this is the other one of those inciting events that I was talking about. We had the blackmailing slash romantic letter <laughs> from Miss Smith to Jack, and we've got the news of Ponchtich's death. And all of a sudden, exactly as you said, the world looks different and Stephen looks different and he's behaving differently towards Diana. He digs out the address of this contact for her to follow and... Maybe his heart gives him some trouble with what he has to say next. He says, should you ever be questioned about me, you are to say that we are old acquaintances no more, that I advise you as a medical man, that there is nothing between us whatsoever, nothing between us at all. And O'Brien writes that Stephen saw the flash of anger, the cruelly wounded pride on her face. He took her hand and said, you are to lie, my dear. You are to tell a black lie. And the very, very touching response from Diana, who says, I will say it, Stephen, but I shall find it hard to be very convincing. And standing there straight with her head held high, his heart moved in him as it had not moved this great while. And he said, God bless, my dear. I am away. Yes. Oh, Mike, I think these two might be back on course here. Oh my gosh, this was just such a wonderful moment. Yeah, a real, a real rush of... Oh, this could all be okay. No matter what's going to happen yes. in the Baltic, no matter what's going to happen with Jack and Sophie and Miss Smith, no matter what's going to happen with Kimber and the Silver Mines, maybe, just maybe, Stephen and Diana can be okay. They're going to have to be apart, and she's pregnant and in Paris, and there's spying and intrigue. But all of that just takes a little bit of a step back for a moment, and we enjoy the fact that they're acknowledging each other in this way. It's really great. Yeah, some real love and affection here with their blessings exchanged and love sent to Jack and Sophie and Diana saying, Stephen, pray take care of yourself. We end that chapter on a very warm note. And as you've been saying, Ian, the feeling that maybe the book is really kicking off now. It's a real pleasure to welcome to the podcast our guest, Adam Franti. Adam is based in Michigan. Adam has a master's in history from East Michigan University and specialized in the War of 1812. So, Adam, it's particularly great to talk to you as we are still in the O'Brien timeline, caught up, I think, in the War of 1812. Um, Adam, I understand that you're still busy as a social media historian and you were involved recently in the Ask Historians public history debate on Reddit. So, yeah. Uh, 
welcome, Adam, and uh, tell us a bit about that. How, how, how did you get into being interested in the War of 1812? Sure. Yeah, thanks. I'm, I'm happy to be here. Big fan of the show, and I've been listening oh, to you. it, I think, almost since the start, as a matter of fact. <gasps> Yeah. <laughs> so my, my interest in the War of 1812 actually first started when I worked at Fort Mackinac. In, it's, a bit, it's in the Straits of Mackinac, which is uh, right between Lake Huron and Lake Michigan, two of the largest Great Lakes uh, around the state. And it was uh, an active fort uh, involved in the War of 1812. And I worked at the fort uh, between 2011 and 2014. And so I worked actually during the big War of 1812 bicentennial and as part of you know being a tour guide and a historical interpreter there, I had to read about and learn about and give tours about the War of 1812 and Fort Mackinac's role there. And more or less, the more I read about it, the the more I found out about this sort of weird little war that isn't very well covered in American history curriculums, the more I was fascinated by it, the more I wanted to know about it, more or less started from there. Also fair to say, it's not very well covered in history curricula that are taught in, uh, in, in British schools either. <laughs> Yeah, I think probably most comprehensively in Canada, it seems to be where, <laughs> where everybody really is interested in it. So catch us up for a second. Give us the uh, the sort of three or four sentence version of how did we all get to the point of this war breaking out? What was the context? Sure. So there are three major causes. So I think the first thing to kind of uh, make clear right away is that this was a war declared on Great Britain by the United States. Um, which is something that sometimes gets lost uh, in the noise. It, there, there's this reputation in the United States that the War of 1812 was the second war of independence, that it was like some confirmation of the revolution. The British tried to come back and get revenge on the United States. And the actual truth is that the United States felt like Britain was interfering with the United States sovereignty around in the first decade or so of the 19th century. Uh, and it was related to to three causes, and most of these causes actually were directly related to the Napoleonic Wars, which had been going on, obviously, for a long time, and even connected, obviously, to the wars of the French Revolution and, and whatnot. So the first two causes were uh, primarily naval, actually, and this is uh, one of the reasons that I think uh, O'Brien makes sure to kind of put the war in the middle of, of a, a few of his novels, right? Is, um, so there were, the first one was... Um, the British had what they called the Orders in Council, which was a, a blockade, essentially, of the European mainland. And they were essentially acting as trade interdiction between any neutral nation and especially the French. So the, the Americans, being the nation with the largest sort of merchant fleet in the Atlantic, yeah. felt like that was kind of an unfair uh, restriction on, on their trade rights. Right. So yeah. if you remember the kind of the slogan that you, you may recall, some listeners may recall, is free trade and sailors rights was one of the kind of early rallying cries of the war. So that that was the kind of free trade angle. The sailors rights angle uh, also had to do with the Napoleonic Wars, because as we've seen in the books, the Royal Navy needed men all the time. You know, even, you know, a frigate needs three or four hundred men. Ships of the line need, you know, twice, three, four times as many men. And they all hopefully are well-trained, seasoned, able hands. And there just aren't that many sailors out there with those kind of skills. And in order to fill up their ships and fill up the, the crew uh, ratings for their ships, they had the impressment service, which could pretty much legally take any, any British citizen who wasn't otherwise employed, could just be shoved onto a ship. One of the ways the British sort of tried to deal with this problem was by stopping neutral ships, trade ships and whatnot, and searching them for British citizens. So Americans kind of looked at this as a particular attack on their sovereignty, as a particular insult to their own national assertiveness. And things really came, it almost came to a war in 1807, doing what they called the, uh, the Chesapeake Affair. And real briefly, the Chesapeake Affair was when a British ship, the HMS Leopard, the horrible old <gasps> Leopard, uh, horrible fired, <laughs> fired on a uh, U.S. ship called the USS Chesapeake. Uh, and boarded it and found four Royal Navy deserters, one of whom they ended up hanging. Um, and uh, this was right outside a harbor in Maryland. It, it touched off an international incident that almost led to a war in 1807. The third thing uh, about the War of 1812 was what they called the Indian problem. And this was connected to uh, the rise of a pan-Indian movement, they called it. There were a couple of Shawnee uh, named Tenskwatawa and Tecumseh, who were brothers, who were essentially trying to form this sort of pan-continental alliance against the United States. And they had been politically backed by Great Britain. 
at the time. So the Americans, again, felt like the way that they treated it wasn't that it was this act of Native American sovereignty. Uh, it was actually the British doing all of that, right? I think uh, even Andrew Jackson has a quote saying that that the prophet, Tenskwatawa, was an engine set in motion by the British. And so they, they blamed this kind of pan-Indian movement directly on British interference in their sort of territorial affairs. And so all of this kind of led in June of, of uh, 1812 to the United States to declare war on, on Great Britain. And the big strategic goal was to capture Canada. And they figured if they capture Canada, they'll be able to either bargain it back for trade concessions and an end to impressment and an end of interference in American sovereignty, or they would keep it because, of course, who doesn't want to be an American? Or, you know, they'd figure kind of a third way or, or something else to do with it. But that was essentially, it was a war of aggression declared on Great Britain by the United States with the goal of, of capturing and annexing Canada in, in some in some affairs. It wasn't super popular. Uh, it was viewed as a war, even at the time, that was uh, entirely political. It was declared basically by one political party in order to further the political aims of that political party. And it's funny, Adam, you, you're reminding me in hearing the story about the Indian problem, course three, as you put it, it was pretty deft then, and I'm sure deliberate by O'Brien to have the Indian porter in the lobby of the Asclepia <laughs> to be a temporary ally of Stephen Maturin. I hadn't figured that out. Yeah. It, it always sort of bums me out that Stephen wasn't able to take a trip up to, you know, Michigan or the Great Lakes <laughs> and meet up with some Shawnee or and Potawatomi allies or something like that. I thought that... Right, because in, in other parts of the canon, especially later on, he goes on some big trips inland you know, when he's in Asia, for example. Yeah, yeah. He goes and meets indigenous people and has some really interesting discoveries and does some really interesting bits of story. So he missed out there, maybe. Yeah, yeah. Mm, what a shame. So let's get back into O'Brien for a second. What, what's your origin story with Patrick O'Brien, Adam? How did you get into the books? So I am young enough that I remember when the movie came out uh, and I was in high school and probably I was probably not quite ready to read the books in high school. <laughs> Had slightly different reading habits and, and slightly different life experience at the time. Um, <laughs> but uh, I remember the movie coming out and this was I, I can't remember if it was before or after the Pirates of the Caribbean movie, but it was around the same time. I remember going to see it and, and enjoying it. And it was something that like I, I liked it. It wasn't something that I came away with being like, oh, this is amazing. I'm going to go read all of the books right now. But uh, years, years later, I had a friend who had been going through uh, the series and was probably on book 11 or 12 or something like that and was just raving about them. And uh, I was like, you know, I think I think by that time I had read the first book and I liked it again. And I just sort of set it aside. And I was like, you know, what? I'm going to give this a shot again. I'm going to read it again. And for whatever reason, the second time it clicked and I, I really enjoyed it. And I really enjoyed the voice that O'Brien brought to it. And I enjoyed all of the, the, the details. And by then I had done some research about the War of 1812 and I knew the War of 1812 was coming up at some point. So I was like, oh, well, I'm going to can't wait to get there. And uh, <laughs> and, if, you know, that time it, it, it really hooked me. And I, I think I read probably the first 10 books just straight back to back. And then since then, obviously, I've taking a break here and there but i've read i've read the rest of them wow and are you a circumnavigator are you one of those that goes back and rereads i am actually in the middle of a reread uh with my partner she's also uh, a fan of the books between us we we've uh, appreciated the land side uh, of things quite a lot more uh and i've and she's gotten me to read some jane austen and i can kind of see the the relationship that I, I know Patrick O'Brien has mentioned it a few times, being a big fan of Jane Austen. But we're, we're actually going through and rereading them all right now. So how would you rate O'Brien's coverage then of the 1812 war overall? I'm honestly like consistently amazed at, at how how right some of the details are. And and given that is, you know, his main characters are British sailors. So there's there's going to be some things that aren't covered. Right. So like uh like we mentioned, the, the sort of Native American portion of the war is sort of, it's not there in the books, but it doesn't necessarily need to be because they're in Boston. Um, you know, they're, they're focused solely on the kind of naval portion of the war. So I think it's, it's amazing. I mean, even, even in things like um, uh, Johnson, you know, the kind of villain of the fortune of war is portrayed as this kind of um, died in the wool Democratic Republican. Uh, I think it's mentioned that he's, you know, friends with the Secretary of State. 
and just all these kind of little castaway details, even of the internal politics of the United States and the unpopularity of the war and the little protests and resistances and, and the way that that was portrayed, even while these two guys are essentially imprisoned in Boston, um, was really well done. And I, obviously, you know, the the details of the actual frigate engagements and uh, the naval battles and everything are pretty much second to none. But I'd probably, if I were to give him a grade, I'd probably give him an A just on focusing on the War of 1812. And, and not even just because he's one of the few writers that even mentions that this is a war that happened. <laughs> It's great. And it's funny, you mentioned the Secretary of State. There's a mention when I think uh, Stephen Maturin's in the hotel suite that's occupied by uh, Diana Villiers and Johnson, and somebody mentions Mr. Secretary. Does, does that mean that we had Stephen Maturin in, in the vicinity of James Monroe, do you think? I think it might be, yeah. I think <laughs> it's a good thing that Monroe wasn't the guy who, who came into the room he was hiding in <laughs> the first time. <laughs> might have been a different story. <laughs> yeah. And it, it seems like there was quite a preponderance of uh, opinion against the war. I guess you'd say federalist opinion in, in Boston. Was that O'Brien being optimistic or was the city really kind of evenly split like that? I, I think it's it represented pretty well, um, especially in the northern states. Uh, so the very, very briefly, the kind of politics uh, of the United States at the time were split between the two political parties, the Federalists and the Democratic Republicans. Uh, and the Democratic Republicans were headed, essentially, uh, during the war by James Madison, who was the president. Um, but then there's also an element of the Federalist Party that were essentially just capitalists, right? They were kind of the yeah. early, you know, capitalism doesn't quite exist yet, but it's they're, they're working toward it. And these are kind of bankers and shipbuilders and insurance agents and right. all of the people who are affected by this massive trade ban to, you know, uh, Whatnot. But they opposed the, the Democratic Republicans mostly because Jefferson, uh, as in response to the Chesapeake affair, actually banned trade in the United States for quite a long time. He called them the restrictive acts. And one of, one of the, the things that it did was actually ban exports, period. Well, you can see dissatisfaction with that state of affairs yes. in, the, in the character of, uh, of, of Mr. Herapath in Boston. He's yeah, really for sure. not happy. And I think he, he really sounds like he belongs to the wing of the party that you're talking about right now. Yeah, yeah. But O'Brien really did know what he was talking about and had really you know, studied even the American politics in this to make sure that kind of all these little character beats, uh, especially with regard to Johnson, uh, land. And I, I think they're actually really accurate and uh, very representative of what politics would have been like in a city like Boston during the war. It's fascinating. And we see a little bit of the the the, the, the honour and the competency of the US Navy. I, I think the characters of people like Lawrence and Bainbridge are written by O'Brien in a very kind of admiring and even-handed way, at least I, I hope so. Um, who, who were the other big heroes of the, uh, of the American side of the War of 1812? Uh, Isaac Holt won a couple of frigate uh, victories early on in the war. Um, there was Stephen Decatur, who was a pretty famous um, captain of the United States Navy uh, during the time. He actually has a somewhat of a relationship to the Chesapeake affair as well. Now, does that bring us into the world of dueling as well? Because I think I remember you saying earlier on that there's a there was a yeah. duel involving Decatur, if I got that right. Yes. So uh, it actually took place um, in 1820. The duel and the duel is between um, uh, Stephen Decatur and uh, uh, Captain Barron. So Captain Barron was actually the captain of the Chesapeake uh, when the Chesapeake struck its colors uh, under fire from the Leopard. So Barron was court-martialed, and this is something that again O'Brien actually covers pretty well. The idea that you, know, if you lose a ship, you get court-martialed, and it doesn't necessarily mean that you're going to get punished. But Barron um, was essentially found guilty of. Uh, not outright treason, but sort of incompetence and cowardice. And he was uh, cashiered from the Navy and served for, for a time as a merchant captain. And then when the War of 1812 started again, he was brought back into the Navy, served for uh, a little a little bit of a time. But Stephen Decatur was actually on Barron's court-martial in 1807. And he sort of remembered this court-martial and thought that reinstating him into the Navy was a mistake and made that opinion pretty widely known. And so in 1820, Barron and uh, Decatur had a duel, and uh, Decatur ended up dying. Uh, he, they, they had a pistol duel, and uh, Barron killed him. Uh, and this was 
considered a pretty how was that good received block. by the public at large <laughs> yeah i'm not sure how it was received by the public uh but it, it was one of these kind of high uh sort of notorious elements that um made the united states navy really try to put a stop to dueling between officers it, it was definitely kind of one of the wake-up calls to the united states navy having having an officer like decatur who is this sort of decorated like he's almost like a jack arbery type figure he's a sort of decorated um, frigate captain and has a string of victories under his belt and a, a kind of public following and public popularity and and for him to get killed by a kind of a third rate captain like baron was uh, you know it, it got them thinking like there's got to be a better way to handle things like this <laughs> so adam i want to just see what we can do to wrap up the war of 1812 because it's sort of about to drift out of our sight in the canon as we move on through the surgeon's mate and stephen and jack are in other parts of the world in in the real historical timeline how did the war of 1812 actually come to a conclusion yeah it's it's kind of an interesting uh quandary in the books right because we've got this um i think they, they term it the long 1812 where this sort of series of consecutive years that don't really advance the actual timeline kind of filter on by i mean while you know jack's kids are getting older and his career is advancing but it's still just 1812 over and over right so kind of it keeps us in that liminal space where the books don't really address the end because if you address the end then it's 1814 and then yeah. the Napoleonic Wars are ending, and then what's Jack going to do? <laughs> um, but uh, so the, the actual war ended up um, coming to a conclusion officially on December or December 24th on Christmas Eve, 1814. Uh, and this was what they called the Peace of Christmas Eve. But uh, so they signed a, a peace treaty in Belgium, and that concluded the war. And the, the whole thing had amounted to what they used in the, the treaty terminology, status quo antebellum which everything goes back to the way it was before the war. So all of the territory, so the, the English and the, the British had taken some American territory, which actually included Mackinac Island. They had actually defended Mackinac Island in an attack in 1814 uh, and kept it. And the Americans had occupied some uh, territory in Florida, which was still owned by Spain at the time, and a few other places. But basically everything reverted to who owned what before the, the war actually started excluding the territories in Florida. So like the United States actually ended up capturing Spanish territory during the war rather than British territory, rather than Canada, which they wanted. So it's sort of goofy little thing. But the real consequence, whereas the war came to a conclusion mostly because the Napoleonic Wars had ended, at least they had ended the first time. Uh, so Napoleon had been defeated. Uh, this was obviously before Waterloo. But the defeat of Napoleon meant that it freed up all of the veteran troops that had been fighting in the peninsula all of the veteran troops uh, and all of those kind of the, the extra active duty ships that were serving blockades and, you know, going after French, uh, everything could swoop over to North America at that point. And this was something that the United States did not want. Um, so after a couple of battles in which the United States ended up um, winning, they ended up signing the treaty uh, more or less in a way that sort of like we're talking about dueling that allowed the United States to save face. You know, they didn't invade Canada. Well, they did invade Canada several times, but they never captured any significant territory in Canada. Um, they weren't able to stop impressment or stop uh, the orders in council, which had actually been repealed before the United States declared war uh, on Great Britain. But essentially those kind of three major points were mostly unaddressed. Um, the three major points that started the war were mostly unaddressed by by the treaty. And, you know, the United States didn't have to worry too much about uh, Great Britain swooping down and taking its sailors away because the war, the, the Napoleonic Wars were over. Uh, they didn't have to worry about the orders in council because, of course, they had already been repealed. But there was really no reason to blockade mainland Europe anymore because Napoleon had been defeated. Um, but the biggest consequence was that Britain actually backed off in Native American affairs um, in the Great Lakes region and kind of along the border territories between the United States and Canada at that point. Uh, and they no longer took an active role in um, uh, politically supporting or economically supporting um, Native Americans that were basically in sort of the American purview, the American kind of um, bubble of sovereignty. And that had a huge effect on the course of uh, history in the continent, but it is sort of outside the scope of, of kind of the way that we tend to think about the war of 1812 and the Napoleonic wars, because it was this big struggle between Great Britain and the United States. And, you know, the natives played a role, 
but that one's sort of it's it's somewhat unaddressed uh, in in sort of the popular take on the War of eighteen twelve. Um, but it did come to a conclusion, and somewhat famously, there was uh, another battle fought after the peace had been signed uh, at the Battle of New Orleans, which happened in January of 1815. And so that technically uh, happened after the war ended. But of course, before anybody in North America knew that the war had ended because it took so long for word to get across the Atlantic. Um, yeah, and the, and the combination of um, the victory in New Orleans and the, the timing of the treaty sort of made everybody think that, oh, the United States definitely won the War of 1812, right? <laughs> and that's that's part of how it has this reputation as kind of the second war of independence or this sort of confirmation of American independence that, uh, you know, of course we won. Of course the United States won. Uh, when in reality it was a glorified tie <laughs> where nobody really got anything <laughs> what they wanted to out of it, um, with the exception of, you know, protecting Canada. Um, so the British, the British did that. Um, but failed at a few attempts to kind of force the war to end uh, by invading uh, at New Orleans and in upstate New York as well. Oh, well, that's very British of us to be satisfied with a dishonorable <laughs> tie. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> For our listeners who are interested in history, interested in following you some more, where can they find you? Where, whereabouts are you online? Probably the easiest uh, way to get hold of me would be to contact me through Reddit. Um, mm -hmm. So my, my username is you party Moses. Fantastic. In that case, Adam, thank you very much for coming and joining us on the show. It's been really great to have you with us. Thank you for all the in-depth and in-depth context on the War of eighteen twelve. I think it really helps to put the books into uh, into a into a timeline. Well, yeah. Thank you for having me on. I, I have a lot of fun. Very good. Thank you. Same for us too. And uh, talk to you again soon. Yep. Thanks, Adam. Yep. Bye. So that was a great conversation with our guest Adam Franti. We hope you enjoyed it and we'll be sharing an extended version of that interview with more detail on the Chesapeake Affair and more detail on dueling with our supporters over on Patreon.com. Meanwhile, back to the show. So it would be the right thing for O'Brien to do at this point, I think, Mike, for Jack to go and pack a sea chest and to gather some maybe old and maybe new shipmates around him and go find some kind of floating conveyance and maybe undercut himself ashore as well. Maybe, maybe that's what's going to happen in the next chapter, or maybe not. Well, you certainly know that Jack would love to do that. We certainly know that Stephen is probably headed straight back to Sir Joseph Blaine to say, let me pick up where Ponzi has failed now. And we have to wonder what exactly is going to happen. Where's Kimber in all this? Where's Miss Smith? Where, you know, all of these questions that were still looming. But now with these inciting events, it sounds like it's going to get even more exciting. So, Ian, what do you say next week to a little bit more Patrick O'Brien? Oh, my gosh, I like it of all things. Takeda? 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 I have no idea how to pronounce it. <laughs>